Good evening to all of you. Before we start today's session, please feel free to do event check in. This will give you access to additional resources and information about events that we are running on Reactor, which are around similar topics to today's session. Also, you will be able to access links from today's session. I will share the event check in link in the e with the event ID in the Q&A section shortly. Also, we have launched our reactor group on LinkedIn. I will share the joining link again in the chat section soon. Thank you all once again for joining us today. My name is Rashmita and I'm the event planner for Microsoft Reactor Bengaluru, India. The session will run over the next 60 minutes, including Q&A. The session is being recorded and will be uploaded to our Reactor YouTube channel. I will share the link to our YouTube channel in the chat section soon. Quick word on a code of conduct. We display this at all Microsoft Reactor events that we run, and it's just a reminder to be aware of others. Key thing to take out here is to be respectful of other people's views, understanding of differences, being kind and considerate in the way you engage. The chat will be open throughout and we do encourage you all to participate. Please keep your mics muted during the session. I would now like to welcome Vivek and Arvind, our speaker for today's session. Arvind is a backend developer and has 10 years of development experience. Currently, he works at Elastic as developer advocate. Our next speaker, Vivek, is a tech enthusiast and an open source contributor with around 15 years of experience in the software industry. He works at Microsoft as senior cloud advocate. But for now, I will hand over to both of you to begin the session. Over to you. Hey, thanks, Rashmita. Thanks for the introduction. And I would like to welcome Arvind for this Azure Happy Hour. Um, not every day we have amazing guest at the Azure Happy Hour, right? So it's always me. And uh, th you know, this time we have uh, Arvind as well. So uh, you know, two weeks back um, we did discuss about. Uh, various things and I'm just going to share my screen and show you what all we discussed in the last two weeks back. Um, just give me a minute sharing the screen. OK, so we did launch a cloud skill challenge. Um, you know, if you see the chat, uh, you'll get the link to this cloud skill challenge. So this cloud skill challenge is nothing but a set of learn modules learning path for you to understand how to build Elastic Stack on Azure. And um, you know that you know you can go through all the three different options of how to deploy and what, how to choose, and which of those options to choose, right? Uh, so make sure you uh, go to this Cloud Skill Challenge and uh, you know complete those learn modules and understand uh, how to do it. While we did that, um, you know, a couple of things uh, we discussed were uh, three different options. Um, you know, one was through the marketplace, and the other was through Azure, uh, sorry, Elastic Cloud, uh, which is which is through Azure portal itself. And uh, today we are specifically discussing about Elastic on uh, Azure Kubernetes service. Uh, obviously, we did discuss about the different options, when to do, uh, when to uh, pick which one, and other things. But today. Uh, we want to focus on Kubernetes, right? And even before I get into Elastic and Azure Kubernetes service and how uh, we have to use it and deploy it uh, and see the demo of it, uh, we need to understand what is Kubernetes, when do we need to use Kubernetes, and why we need to pick Kubernetes specifically from Elastic perspective. So I will let um, Arvind to talk about uh, Talk about the you know uh, the Kubernetes, uh, give us an overview and uh, give us more information about the structure architecture of Kubernetes, and uh, and then we will take the discussion to Elastic how to deploy you know uh, you know uh, Elastic on the Kubernetes and when to choose it uh, when to choose that option uh, and all yours Arvind so you can just uh, get started with the Kubernetes. Thank you, thank you, thank you for inviting again uh, me to Reactor. I always enjoyed, uh, of course, like enjoyed more being at the uh, the Reactor uh, place in the in the office, 
and then it's more fun and we all i guess uh, everyone in the meeting would definitely agree that happening these sort of events in in person uh, i look forward to, to those days again but that being said again thank you for inviting and i hope that i will be able to cover at least some bit of uh, knowledge that i have on uh, like you know kubernetes before we go and talk about elastic search running uh, stateful apps what are stateful apps or like general purpose data stores or etc etc so so please do take cloud skilling challenge like what uh, vivek has said uh, i have uh, noticed that a lot of people who have taken cloud skilling challenge uh, previously like for various other reasons uh, on on previous cloud skilling challenge have have started to write blogs as well which is very interesting to me so i think you could become uh, you could be a speaker you could be like you know uh, get more skills so that being said i think uh, uh, like let us get into the today's topic so i i am arvind and uh, i work at elastic as a developer advocate and uh, i run a newsletter at uh, newsletter.arvind.dev uh you can either find it in my blogs or like you know if you are if you are connected to me on linkedin or twitter you would very much uh, find that out i i generally write about all of these and that being said uh, i i am into uh, most of these communities i like uh, interacting with developers uh, i kind of like uh, have, have have been in these communities for like more than 5 years and then uh, doing these sessions so the key takeaways from today's session uh, is like uh, we we're going to talk about obviously elastic stack uh, but then on kubernetes and there is a speciality uh, in what uh, kubernetes does uh, in general right and then uh, and then like uh, when we when we bring that something like a stateful data, uh, data store uh, like elastic search uh, how kubernetes which is a distributed system by itself uh, how would it would work and what are the ways that you could do it so before all of this like like i said uh, we're going to do a one on one a bit on elastic stack and then we go back to the kubernetes uh, and then like we go back again talk about running this particular software on kubernetes and then we'll also take a lot of questions we'll also see we could show a demo as well uh, so if you if you have any questions stop me in between uh, put it in chat uh, i guess like vivek please help me like if you have any questions or if you see any questions that you have to stop me please stop me in between and i'll, I'll i think like i i could see your screen but then like somehow that vanished on the second screen i need to pull that up so so yeah please please let me know uh, that would really help actually so hope hope you are able to uh, see the screen and everything right Yes, we can, we can see the screen. Yeah. Okay, that's great. That's great. Just give up. Okay. Great. So so basically, uh, Elasticsearch uh, Elasticsearch is a search engine. And last time uh, when I spoke about uh, when I spoke about Elasticsearch in detail, uh, we also spoke about the overall stack and also like the solutions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but I want to do a quick overview again. If you haven't, also refer to the previous uh, reactor uh, event that we did with Elasticsearch. But then, like uh, Elasticsearch is a search engine. It's a distributed NoSQL uh, REST-based REST API-based uh, data store. On top of it, which you have a Kibana, which is a UI on top of Elasticsearch where interacts with all the apis help you to do analytics bunch of use cases etc then you have logstash and beats which are like ingestion modules where it can pull data from various data sources and then push into elastic search so that's the overall stack which is called elastic stack uh, previously or most popularly people call it as elk e l k so you have e you have l you have k so they that's why they call us e l k and generally we put developers put such acronyms to uh, several of these stacks and then such such way e l k has gone but it e l k has become so much and uh, so big and so different now even i couldn't realize that okay it's the same company that i'm working for so there are so many new modules and so many new uh, open source tools that we have and that's why it is elastic stack it's evolving and uh, to encompass a lot of developer ecosystem so let us so so out of this stack the stack that you see here that is represented here as a brick you could see the stack there are three uh, separate apps or use cases that most use uh, people use for uh, so like for example the the uh, the the search use cases which is the enterprise search which contains site search app search and all of these things these experiences and you have elastic observability which everyone knows if you are from devops i think logs metrics traces 
uh, you know, your CI CD pipelines, like, you know, collecting, doing observability on top of it. And lastly, like, obviously you have elastic security and then uh, folks use it to protect their environments and do threat hunting, seam, etc. So these are the three basic use cases. And okay, who uses elastic search? A lot many people uh, ask me this question and that's why I have this specific slide. Like you have, you can be a developer, you can be a DevOps engineer, you could be a, a product owner, uh, someone who like says, hey, this page needs to be loaded in eight seconds and how do I monitor that? Like you're a scrum master or something like that, or an engineering manager or director or something, or you could be a infosec person or someone from security community who is specifically looking for who is trying to access the server in this midnight and like, uh, how do I find that how many times like, you know, Arvind has logged into the system at around this period of time and also failed three times accessing this machine. So all of these interesting experiences you could find out, you could ask Elasticsearch and then it would give you uh, the results in a more interactive manner. Look, Elasticsearch is cloud agnostic. You could obviously deploy it on various varieties of, uh, or, or integrate with different varieties of Azure uh, cloud services. Uh, say, for example, App Service, or like, you know, you could integrate with Event Hub, uh, like ACS, uh, Azure Cloud Storage, like, you know, use it in multiple ways. Today, we're going to specifically talk about the Kubernetes, uh, uh, Kubernetes ecosystem, which is a Azure Kubernetes service, which it itself is like a very big uh, thing and a ocean in general. And then uh, we're going to talk about uh, the a specific way to kind of run apps on Kubernetes, which is uh, which is via an operator. I'll, I'll explain what is an operator, etc. So Elastic Cloud on Kubernetes is an operator that you could run a cloud as a service on Kubernetes. And again, this is also a free and open product that you could go and download and use it. So like Vivek said, I think uh, we'll definitely go into uh, what is what is uh, Kubernetes and uh, like because if you are a newcomer or if you are already into Kubernetes, but then these questions come up because I've been hearing Kubernetes for like or, or doing uh, some sort of work on uh, either base like as a developer, as an administrator or something else in, in, in the Kubernetes world for like uh, from the in, in like from the time the project has started like 2015. And then uh, I have still have a lot of things that I don't know and I keep referring the documentation or I tried finding some videos. So it's not bad uh, if if you know or if you don't know, like 101 always helps uh, beginning of the session. So basically uh, Kubernetes is a container orchestration system. So if you don't know containers, I mean, uh, the Learn uh, CDs in the Microsoft also have fantastic tutorials to learn about containers in general. Uh, and then it is not specifically related to Docker, but then uh, Docker is a way to manage containers or like, you know, work with containers. So what I would generally say is like uh, Kubernetes helps you to manage this large number of containers that you help you orchestrate, you you scale up like and becomes 20,000 containers in your infrastructure, like, you know, your VM or something. And then um, and then like kind of uh, how do you manage those, right? Kubernetes is a way that you can manage, cherry pick, and probably kill uh, some of those or like, you know, upgrade them, uh, release a new app, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these are uh, things around that experience. So basically Kubernetes uh, made it easy to manage all of this. Like you would see and uh, you, you could always see this uh, 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 architecture below the slide that I wrote. I'll explain some of these and I'll make it clear. But then uh, what Kubernetes is also is like, a, you could manage all of this uh, in a declarative way, like what uh, if you see Vivek's video, there is like uh, YAML is the new code, <laughs> right? And in a similar way, like using YAML, you could literally manage all of this using just a declarative way. You tell like, you know, hey, this is the type of the uh, machine that I want to like or, or a resource that I want to access. And then and then like I want to uh, add add another container to it or like add this IP to that particular resource. You could tell all of that in your configuration file. Uh, which is written in YAML and then Kubernetes un simply understands it like its language and then implements it. So how all this system like at this point of time you might see it like a back black box, but how all this works is is pretty simple. Uh, uh, I mean, it's simple that if you if you could really uh, get to uh, it. So basically uh, you have pods. Uh, pod is like uh, the yellow color thing that you see here is like a pod and then it contains uh, the containers that we are telling. So if you again go go down, containers are nothing but your uh, lightweight OS that you are running uh, as a simple a simple uh, layer, the user layer that you are running, and that you could do all of that. So 
there are multiple pods in multi different nodes so you have vms and then on top of it each vm runs a pods and then these pods are managed by the services uh, and connected to these volumes uh, that the hard disks and also like also have external other components like secret store etc so as you could see this is a, this is in crux this is what uh, is kubernetes is like you have services you have pods which contain containers and you have a hard disk again like storage network compute so that's how you could really remove them uh, so there are many more resources that exist like i just don't want to complicate the first slide so i just want to explain it very simply so you have deployments whenever you push a, you push a specific sort of a say hello world right that's a program and you push that you get a deployment and then you could have that n replicas of deployment say for example you have many million people asking hey what is that arvin that you have deployed then like it says it's hello world so that particular thing is asked by million people and then you might want to have it scaled up so that it serves it could serve for a million people or like uh, in, in indian uh, terms like a crore or like a, a 10 crore number of people right to access that so you need you need multiple deployments so that's why a deployment is there similarly you might want something to be run as a daemon like as you know daemon is something that a program that could uh, potentially run uh, easily so you you might want specifically want to run uh, can you still hear me Okay. Okay. I think something happened. Anyway. Yes, so. So. Hear. Okay. Sorry. I think there's something. Some hitch. Anyway. So basically. Uh, so basically, you see, uh, a daemon is something that can be run. Uh, like you know, in inside a pod and like daemon set. Uh, like it keeps on running until the pod is killed. So uh, and then like it can collect all the information about these containers. Uh, its metadata, what apps it is running. So. All of that. So a demo set is same pod running on all nodes, and then uh, and then like you have a persistent volume. So all of these are resources. Like uh, so, for example, the stateful set is an important resource that we are going to talk about today, uh, specifically. So what stateful set uh, does is uh, it it kind of like you know uh, helps you to uh, specifically helps you to like kind of run some sort of a stateful dis distributed or data store machines. Like uh, for example, uh, you take Elasticsearch itself; it contains some state, right? So, uh, stateful sets are a concept in Kubernetes that helps you to run this uh, uh, run 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 these applications seamlessly in Kubernetes. So, like I said, YAML is the new code, and uh, you could mention all of this in a declarative fashion, and then uh, in a well-defined schema, of course. And uh, so, you for example, if you want to spin up a pod with an example app. So this is how you do it. Where you pull it, you pull it from a, a specific uh, container registry, and then you have uh, the uh, a specific API version. I mean, if you want to create a service, you do this. If you want to create a secret, you do this. So you create AMLs for it, and you run a specific command, uh, and then it just gets created on on the infrastructure. And it's all easy. It's all uh, you don't need to like you know uh, run a Terraform module uh, to create this inventory or manage it. So it's much much better. Uh, in way in 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 management in general. Now, whatever I explained in concepts, and you really put in a high level uh, uh, state or a high level design diagram. So this is how it looks like actually. So Kubernetes is what we saw here, right? The number of nodes, the kubelets that are installed that helps you to manage this cluster, and then uh, the apps that are run in run in the pods, right? These are the ways that Kubernetes is being run, and then you have this API server. Which is like okay. I'll just turn off my video. That's much better, I think. So, uh, so basically, what happens here is uh, uh, the 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 user can run a specific command, and then that command will be getting executed. How would that happen? Say, for example, Kubernetes contains a key value store which is called etcd. It's just like your I should not really compare it with any other uh, data store. HCD is not a cache system, but it's like a, it's also not like a Redis uh, server, but then it is a key value store which can store all the state of the 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 cluster, uh, and it's a distributed again key value store. Like when I say every time distributed, there are multiple nodes highly available, fault tolerant, all the things need to come in your mind. So HCD is there. And then uh, with a watch mechanism, of course, like it has some sort of a watching mechanism so that it keeps uh, looking at it and changes the thing, et cetera, every time and stores all the resources that we spoke, like the demon set information, uh, deployment information, pod information, everything. So HCD is a key value store. 
and then you have the API server, uh, which is like essentially exposes everything in the APIs. That's how you are writing ML to tell to that API. Uh, ML internally gets converted and gets called uh, the get get calls these APIs. So use use a tool uh, with to talk to these APIs. That, that also I'm going to talk about it. So but then these this API server is the central one, which kind of like helps you to manage the cluster everything. So I I spoke in the previous slides about the cluster itself. Now we are talking about something that is outside this cluster uh, and still helps all of this to happen actually. So and then like you have the user which interacts with the his API server. Uh, uh, there are many tools again. Uh, kubectl is one tool that uh, generally people uses and then you can have different flavors of Kubernetes. You can have different distributions of Kubernetes just like Linux. Uh, Kubernetes have different distributions and then uh, you can essentially link that Kubernetes to this particular uh, like kubectl, which is like a curl command. If you have ever uh, used curl, which is like a REST REST API uh, caller or something like that, and then you could you could you could just simply use kubectl to connect your uh, Kubernetes cluster and then execute all the APIs and then get results uh, information on the cluster what's happening. Now the important thing that we didn't cover or I wantingly don't didn't cover so that like you know uh, so that you don't you don't get confused is uh, the kubelet. Kubelet is an agent running on each node, uh, watches the pods in the API server, and like you know, and uh, manages the like you know the containers on the host, etc. So Kubelet is very important, and uh, I think uh, Vivek also has sometimes spoke about virtual Kubelet and more details about Kubelet in, in general. So watch that talk if you want to. Uh, that's an interesting project as well. But then what Kubelet does is like it's like an agent that works with the API server, tells how many nodes are there. Uh, it talks about uh, there are there are specific policies that uh, that helps you to transition these uh, containers between the nodes and a lot of these things. So basically, it's an agent for the API server and and it it helps bring uh, the cluster together, etc. And then you also have uh, the controllers, which is like uh, which helps you to make space which contains the logic, uh, very specific logic, and then uh, that logic helps you to maintain the cluster. Say, for example, if you want to, you're, you are running containers, you are running apps on your Kubernetes environment, but you want to take backup of that apps that are running. How do you take backups? So you need a logic to be, take backup, right? So, uh, so, so what happens is like uh, that logic is put in a think of it like a class or a specific file where all the code is in, uh, present, and then that will run in in correlation with the API server. There are hooks. That will be linked to it and then the controllers will potentially run and then all of this would simply work so controllers are uh, there are many controllers and uh, it has their own logic and each controllers are registered with the api server etc to the hooks and they get executed when the respective resource is called respective uh, you know uh, values are set uh, trigger points are set etc so for example some existing controllers are schedulers which watches the pods assign them to a node say if there is a pod and then like it has some problem and then it 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 like right from the initiation and based on the node left capacity and all these details it takes like oh this pod needs to start in the node 3 like uh, whenever you start a pod it like it says okay this place is free let us put it here so what that is what it, uh, the the some some specific uh, controller would do actually. So another another controller uh, could be like the 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 replication controller, wherein uh, uh, wherein like it helps you to control the uh, correct number of pods. Like there is something called uh, uh, replica set. Like uh, say for example, you always want ten con ten containers available to take your request, uh, or you want a certain number of uh, resources ready to handle the load that is going to come. Say, for example, uh, imagine a IRCTC site and every day morning 10 o'clock the, the, the tickets open and then like people rush to book the, the call tickets and you know that the load is going to come and you keep uh, the infrastructure ready uh, and then you can you can mark that replica set and then it simply handles that load. And you could also reduce that later point of time, but replica set will help you to, if there are, even if there are any errors, it tries to bring that Meanwhile, you do the back end work if, if the error to debug the error, etc. And then you also have several other controllers, uh, like for example, Azure has its own specific controllers to manage a Kubernetes cluster. You could find all of this in the GitHub repo of Kubernetes. Uh, there are specific SIGs uh, for each cloud provider as well. So you could go and look at that as well. Uh, so that is that is an interesting thing. So 
uh, like by this time you would find like Kubernetes is really cool uh, and I want to kind of like uh, 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 learn more about Kubernetes etc. So I think this is a good time to uh, like you know see if there are any questions. I, I think that I don't see any questions but then like Vivek what do you see? Yeah there is there is there is a question there is. Oh, okay. So yeah. uh, the first question is um, so it's I think it's more on elastic stack um, you know is it similar to um, IIS web server log analyzer um, that's what uh, the question is no no see it's, it's more on more on elastic stack so elastic stack was this uh, the you know IIS web analyzer log analyzer uh, is it is it similar to that is what the question is so 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 basically uh, elastic stack is today it's many things to be honest uh, because if i uh, there are many experiences that you could build kubernetes itself is a platform and you could deploy this particular software and then what happens is uh, it's pretty easy to kind of uh, uh, like you know uh, use elastic search for different use cases uh, like say for example we were talking about uh, uh, we, we were talking about search engines, building a search engine. You could use Kubernetes as a platform to build a search engine by using Elasticsearch. Uh, it's not specifically like, okay, it's a, not a log analyzer or it's not a, like, you know, monitoring system. It, it's a general purpose uh, uh, st uh, search engine that you are using different apps to like, you know, make it your, you know, in like, you know, mold it in your own way. I'll show that actually. I'll show that in the Kibana. I have a cluster already deployed. I'll kind of show that. In fact, you can push your logs from the web server to the Elastic Stack to uh, do, you know, to get more data out of it. Log analyzer is, I think, it's just analyzes the log, and you can see the logs, and uh, you can you cannot do much with without the Kibana dashboard, right? The BI uh, is what is uh, Elastic, right? So probably those, I mean, those are the differences. Uh, I don't think so. That will be the um you know it, it's not similar to that for sure uh, elastic is quite uh, different from the uh, iis web server log analyzer and the second question uh, arvind uh, it's it's very specific question because i think um, you know kumar is uh, using um, kibana and he's getting a below some error uh, post installation okay. error. I think this is very specific, Kumar. Probably we can take it, uh, you know, one to one with Arvind. Uh, yeah. You know, after this, after Before, this uh, session, yeah. because he will have to analyze your uh, YAML, right? Uh, I see a couple of things. The UID GID is equal to root, so maybe that is not a problem. But I, I don't want to go in depth with it. But anyways, that is one thing. Um, and he has a specific so, question though from how to configure username and password for kibana and elastic when using bitnami charts so, so this is i would tell you one thing uh, so always use the official distros uh, or like say for example if you are trying to use uh, uh, a specific linux you wouldn't go and uh, use a linux that is not actively supported or actively maintained or packaged by somebody else right so you would always use a Linux that is either a CentOS or like a officially supported by RHEL or uh, all, all these issues that has some packing, that has some engineering team that's going to bring in all the kernel upgrades from the uh, open source system and trying to build that package one and give it to you so that you get updates whenever you do whatever, uh, like, you know, have to get upgrade or like, you know, uh, all, all the patches. So similarly, I, why I am, I have told this example, Kumar, is you are using a wrong distro here. Uh, you are using something called a Bitnami distro, which is not officially. They repackage the Elasticsearch. So I'll tell you, Elasticsearch is so popular that there are that people repackage it and like you know add some layers on top of it, and then they provide it, and it might not really work over a period of time as the APIs and everything would change. So you might be having one of those problems. You could we could we could talk to a uh, like on on LinkedIn or later, and then I'm happy to help actually. So that's that's the major problem here, and uh, I I might not also be helpful uh, like you know because because this is not a standard error that I see generally, uh, and as well as we, that is a follow up answer also is the same like you know you could easily get the free username and password thing uh, when you use the original distro. Uh, okay, let us go to the 
Next question. So a couple of questions uh, I have answered there. Um, so there is the, there's a question from Pramod. Uh, it's basically if deployment is happening on you know DB pod and there is pod one, pod two, and pod pod three accessing the DB pod and we want to stop those access uh, from all the three pods whichever is there or to the production db prod uh, production pod how will you handle this situation good good hackathon project actually huh, so i think uh, i think this is a good, uh, like this is a decent kubernetes question like you you have uh, you have a deployment happening on the on the you have a database running on, under the name same namespace which i think so and then you have uh, you have like you know, these uh, app pods running and then they are trying to connect uh, like you know uh, connect to this the application is trying to connect so one way the advantage of uh, doing uh, uh, using kubernetes is it, it can do rolling upgrades very easily so you should definitely think of how you can do a rolling upgrade and uh, and and like you know and you also want to start them out of the connection i don't know how that helps because your users would obviously see the errors and uh, i'm i'm not nearly sure if you could shut shut them out and uh, not not uh, make them accessible um, if i could get to know more about like why you want to stop the pod 1 pod 2 pod 3 to access db pod and uh, like you know that way probably a better solution can be handled see a lot many times when you are talking about asking a question you're stuck in a specific place then the way the step, previous step that you followed might not be something that is standard and uh, that's where you are landed up here so i i am just asking to correct the previous step as well so so yeah that's that's the thing that i'm trying to explain here um, maybe uh, maybe what you could do is as arvin said right rolling updates uh, you can pause these pods which have accesses and have a new up pods get rolled up uh, using the right set of deployment uh, options uh, which communities provide uh, very you know then you don't have access to db pod but the question is why you want to remove the access is is obviously the question um, anyways that's one part of it um so shall we shall we just continue uh, i don't see much questions after this so let's we can continue this. yeah I, I have few more slides and then like we can take an in again question so please keep asking uh, questions i think there is one question from sandeep uh, just now i think we'll do this and then we'll we'll simply go yes. ahead yes he is more on uh, query dsl work in a similar way to the simple query string method that is is it like doing an API call to Elasticsearch cluster. So uh, Elasticsearch has a REST APS, right? Query DSL is a language that helps you to talk to that APS, right? Uh, so, so if I have to tell you, like you could do some things with the query strings, but say, for example, you want to do uh, like, you know, get slash uh, index name slash underscore search and you do question mark. Q is equal to and then you write the query and then like and put and and then write filter is equal to and you your query string will be big. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend even if you want to do, but not always all the parameters are available on the query string. You have to use it, use the query DSL and uh, to do certain things like specific things or specific aggregations or specific terms that you want to use. You definitely need to give it in the body, uh, the REST API body. So and all the clients support it. So query string is like not much recommended unless you are trying to do it uh, in some other way. But other than I, I don't recommend using query string, but both are more or less same. It calls the same API. One guy goes like, you know, like, you know, doing the same thing. Other guys like put in the, in the body. Body is the recommended way. OK, I'll just quickly, I'll just quickly kind of like uh, go ahead and uh, do the next slide and then like, you know, and then we'll, we'll take more uh, information actually. So deploying applications, uh, a lot many people by this time would feel like you know kubernetes is cool i got to know about containers and this is how i even felt uh, when i got to know about uh, in detail about kubernetes and like this is around 2016 17 time and then i started containerizing a specific app that i am working on and i tried deploying and doesn't have scale and all it's a hobby project that i did and then they don't have a uh, lot many companies don't have kubernetes as a service so this is my personal uh, system and i was using some kubernetes version to do all of that and then i realized that uh, there is a lot many things that an application itself needs like application needs a db application it needs to be built uh, and then there are versions in the application uh, there are many things that 
uh, any application has like you write in java application go application or something that just simply runs a cron job right or a, or a scheduler that you write in uh, a specific programming language uh, so all this needs additional systems and additional stuff that are uh, very important uh, so even though you, it gets more easier to deploy uh, there are more things that are needed so that's when um, uh, like you know helm charts have come in uh, so helm charts is like a package manager for kubernetes uh, so it helps you to manage so before you get into like you know uh, like what is helm charts I'll go, i'm going to explain i have given also the elastic helm charts like if you want to deploy elastic search uh, via helm chart and then ck and i mean helm chart and ck uh, i'm telling you uh, how and why uh, but then this is a url uh, just to keep reminder and, and note them. Uh, so basically, I'm talking about the same thing, deploying applications in Gators. So what uh, uh, Red Hat or or, or, a, or a bunch of people from the open source community have done is like they have built this operator framework, uh, which essentially helps you to deploy applications, general purpose applications. Like, like I said, an application that you write might need a database, might need a specific system like a proxy or a queue or anything else right there are many things that come in uh, in your in your a large scheme of things right so how to deploy other things like this this i have written i'll deploy how do i run that binary should i containerize it or how do i orchestrate it so that's where uh, a lot of industry folks have started you uh, giving out docker containers uh, and then like you can they have dockerized their applications they are producing dockerized binaries and then you you just bring that container and deploy in kubernetes now that is great. Who will manage the backup of the database? Who will manage the some issue or logs that are coming out of it? So it, it all became a big one pointer to like it, it, it expanded, 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 and it became its own thing. Then, uh, okay, I understood. And this is the problem that needs to be solved. And the open source community has come together and created a framework, specifically the CentOS folks, I guess. Uh, they have created this framework called Operator Framework. What Operator uh, does is uh, it it actually uh, it actually pre create lets you create a bunch of controllers that we discussed in previous slides. Uh, you can create a custom controller, and that controller will help you manage a specific set of uh, pods uh, or containers. So that containers are containers from that you uh, that you don't deploy specifically. Uh, you uh, like the it's like the general purpose application like nginx elasticsearch uh you are uh, you're all sorts of dbs uh, like oracle mysql postgres sql all of these dbs anything like different different uh things so what operator i'll also come and talk about like what I, as i told helm and operator i'll also explain what how does the stack look like and what are the differences between helm and operator because both might look really same and uh and specifically uh, might not be it may be confusing as well so for example in a typical uh, system you see operating system you have binaries you have some configuration stuff and then you have package manager like uh, npm uh, that helps you to manage these packages specifically and then you have a configuration manager uh, to manage all these configs as well so what uh, helm specifically or when you deploy things on kubernetes uh, which is like the again a big a distributed system it has multiple components so where is operator uh, placed like you have images you have kts objects which can be the resources etc and then you have the operator uh, that is like the uh, th that those are the controllers that gets placed along that vertical and then you can help and then you have several other tools which does uh, different different things so so this is how the helm versus operator don't confuse helm to be here or don't confuse helm to be directly talking to this that is that used to also happen helm directly can manage and run the, uh, these things uh, the container so don't go to that sort of helm chat always use an op standard operator i i will tell you it will make your life much easier so there is an operator hub go to operatorhub.io just check what is a uh, like you know uh, the operator that is available for you uh, say for example here if you see there is an elastic cloud on kubernetes there are postgres couchbase cockroach db multiple operators by different different people like you also have a hcd operator that you could run so so you could go and find out details again the source code for the elastic cloud on kubernetes operator uh, which is like essentially the stack deployment operator is here go and you can go and contribute or look, or look at it raise issues as well so that's one other thing so now getting to the real deal like any 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 questions at this point of time? I specifically uh, I don't, don't have. I mean, I see there are some questions here. I'll answer them and then like we'll go ahead. Yeah, the question is around uh, how do you migrate? Uh, 
how to migrate uh, now from a helm chart perspective so uh, for the community right um, so basically the helm is a package manager and um, and the operator is more of a devops right it's more of devops you know it's, it's basically you know managing your operations you know it understands what is bought right it's running controller and other things right so it's basically a devops role and the package managing is what helm is um, so that is uh, that is the difference and um, you know the question is uh, migrations how do you handle migrations with helm chart uh, from version 6 to 7 so how do, how so do you, you do that in yeah so you you don't i i would recommend not uh, so you always need to upgrade the of course there are helm chart versions uh, there are there are i mean it, it depends like a lot there are a lot of community members who are very pro helm charts there are a lot of community members who oh, i don't want helm charts i just want to directly talk to operator because i already complicated my life i just want to use one thing and then get done with it okay for folks who are like you know having ci cd pipelines they have some specific uh, tools like argo or jenkins and they want to they are using they're continuously deploying to kubernetes and uh, for them yes i think in the chat kumar has given one specific uh, repo there are helm charts and using that if you upgrade a helm chart which contains operator that also get upgraded uh, i think we we also release the helm charts uh, along with uh, every co ck release and all and then it is it is uh, it is lined so that the helm chart get upgraded and then you you can upgrade upgrade the repo and then uh, and then like you could also deploy and migrate but it is always important uh, to plan your migrations uh, especially data stores anytime so it is not a simple task like you click a button and it will simply migrate anywhere it is your data so you also need to take care of like what are the breaking changes what is the release notes going on so you need to do that due diligence it is just that the upgrade that used to be like you know very hard now it becomes much easier rolling upgrade like uh, you, you kill a container, put a new node, attach the same disk. So that is being done easily. That's why it's, we call it as elastic cloud on Kubernetes. So it's like essentially running a service, a service on Kubernetes. So a, a managed service. So that's what I, I also show here, right? So for example, uh, we have custom resource definitions, which is a CRD uh, methodology that Kubernetes has. For for Elasticsearch, Kibana, and APM, and several other things. Like if you want to deploy Elasticsearch, say kind call on Elasticsearch, and then Elasticsearch controller knows how to manage and or create a pod or set up the default for the machine, right? What you do for the VM is is it, it does it for the container, and uh, and then like how many nodes, what are the uh, feeds that you need to enable, what AML configurations need to be changed in that container that CRD. Uh, specifically knows and just need to instruct it so there are crds for each these each of these things uh, and then and a set of controllers uh, like kind of uh, uh, to manage this process and uh, then which also which automates tasks like you know generating the tls certificates when you spin up this cluster that cluster that i have uh, it, it automatically has node to node encryption uh, and it all of this is free. I mean, I, I'm not just marketing it, but it comes out like that. But it's so easy for developers. It is easy to do all of that. I have done a lot of certificate management in my life and it's painful. And sometimes you might also not know when the certificate gets expired and the system is down. People complain on Twitter and then you, write, you realize that, oh, my certificate is expired. So it's the, all of such sort of a thing is there. Uh, so, so you could get the CLS certificates. You could use Let's Encrypt kind of tool to get your own certificates and test that. And then, um, and then you also have uh, secrets. We we store the secrets in the customs place. And then you have a uh, uh, create a service uh, to like kind of you could do cube CTL get Elasticsearch and you will you will get a custom UI. You will custom custom table and all talking about how Elasticsearch healthy is, what version is of Elasticsearch is deployed, etc. Create ES user deployment templates. Lot of stuff, lot of stuff. Like I, I have this slide is old, and I have lot many things have landed beyond that actually. So, so any questions here? I think I just want to take questions. I think, no, not specifically. So at this point of time, you feel like okay, that's it. Uh, not exactly. I have some more uh, details planned. I'll show you a demo, and I'll show you uh, in the Azure console from now on. Uh, I hope you you are still being able to see my uh, screen. Yes, Vivek. We can see yeah. we can see Great. your screen here. Yeah. Great. So this is Microsoft Azure portal and then you could either uh, to access or create a Kubernetes cluster. You could either go to uh, Kubernetes services that are mentioned here 
or you could uh, type uh, kubernetes service and then it will show up okay so i just uh, use the i just clicked on to it and then uh, and then like i have a specific cluster in the interest of time i created it uh, but then you could also go and create a kubernetes cluster and then um, then like give all the necessary details like the resource group uh, say okay for example this resource group and then uh, cluster name az dev if you, uh, azure developers and then like you have availability zones uh, there is an interesting uh, way that you could also choose uh, 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 there is an interesting way that when somebody mentioned that they can't see the screen is everybody able to see the screen i can see the screen there is no issue yeah i think for a moment i think uh, there is a blip i believe okay. now it should okay yeah okay fine okay. there's a blip okay. definitely i think uh, i noticed that but then so so okay let me do that okay so so here as you could see uh, in this region there is that particular specific uh, details are not there let me change to us central or something and then we will get those information so so there are multiple series of vms uh, so when creating a data store i'm not telling specifically to elastic search but any time uh, when you're creating something on kubernetes choose the right hardware that helps you to create get, get the best performance and uh, just like any other system you might not want to manage multiple clusters but choose clusters different clusters if you consider that x is important then y and then you choose different clusters not for specific apps so you might have a apps cluster but again inside that apps cluster uh, have different namespaces that is a good architecture uh, pattern and then you also have uh, if you have multiple clusters uh, keep your monitoring cluster away from your regular apps cluster so that you don't have a noisy neighbor or something something causes problem to something else so that's how you could uh, do that i have uh, three availability zones checked in here so that is that is one another thing to look at if you want to do that and you could auto scale it i have three nodes set in uh, you could configure multiple node pools add a another node pool um, there are there are many many uh, features that are specific to azure kubernetes service that you could always find out like the authentication you could you could go and do saml space saml based authentication uh, you could go and do azure cni which in turn helps you to connect through the azure uh, like you know active directory and other stuff so that you could do that uh, yeah so more and more details that are very specific to azure uh, you could also connect to the azure monitoring which which pulls all data and show you could show by azure monitor but also you could send the data to event hub kind of a thing and let it be consumed by some other places so all of that is possible always possible uh, one more thing that i want to cover here specifically is like i said i want to stress specifically on this uh, you should use the persistent disks with elastic search uh, so that way what happens is uh, elastic search operates on the basis of like you know the disk is attached and then um, even if your pod gets killed or your container lost connect and when you bring in a new pod or something it gets connected to the same thing the controller will try to find out the specific data and then you have everything so simply easily and connected so this is the hardware uh, choice that we recommend and there is also documentation about it if you want more questions about it i'm happy to answer but i'll always have that uh, the storage class is also very important uh, kubernetes as a storage classes concept and then you also need to find out the right storage classes which i think premium gives you the persistent disk uh, the standard or basic doesn't give you the persistent disk in the azure uh, because it has a lot of options so i i'm i'm really not exactly sure uh, or to suggest you but i can find out find it out for you if you have questions around that so via this way i have created a cluster and that cluster is here as you could see it's a simple uh, azure kubernetes uh, service cluster and then i have all of these details created and uh, what i did is i used uh, the azure cloud shell to connect to this particular uh, you know the, the to connect to this particular uh, the, the the kubernetes service okay let me see if i could remove this guy I'm not able to see the screen I think it should work. So I have uh, okay, got it. So I have this cloud shell here, and then uh, where 
I ran the commands and then I got connected to the Azure Kubernetes service. Again, like I said, kubectl talks to the API server and gets information about the cluster. Say I have deployed uh, Elasticsearch as well. So let me let me do this this way. Um, so let me kill all of that and then get started. So for example, if I do Elasticsearch, uh, I think I would get the status of Elasticsearch, how it is running, etc. So I have a blog here that you could go and see uh, that I specifically wrote some time back about how to create Kubernetes cluster. But if you are uh, like there, it's, it, it has some old versions actually. Now we have 1.7 and then uh, now we have 7.14. I'll get it updated as well as soon as possible. Uh, but uh, I have uh, also the documentation is there so that you could uh, you could potentially uh, like you know go and, and get information about it. Start ECK. Let me see. Hey, Arvind, uh, can you just copy paste that uh, blog in the in the chat so that? Yeah, that was my question too. Yeah, yeah. So all of these comments are given. I just in the in the interest of time, I am not showing you, but then uh, so I can I can run you through it, and it's pretty simple. Uh, so you create Azure resource group, you create a uh, you create a specific cluster, AZ, AKS. Uh, of course, you need to have the Azure uh, SDK installed, uh, Azure uh, Cloud Shell or Azure SDK installed on your laptop. I would prefer you do it on a cloud shell. It gets more professional and like you know uh, you can get a production feed, and then um, and then you have. Uh, uh, like you know, can connect to the uh, cluster, and then you can install the ECK operator. Uh, and then, for example, I could run and show you how the operator is working. Uh, like say, I don't know this specific. Ah, okay, we got it. So uh, I could go and run this uh, a, a specific command to see how the operator itself is like uh, uh, kind of like running in my in my Kubernetes. So operator itself. Contains a bunch of classes like the like we, so, we spoke about resources, CRDs, controllers, and that is logging information how it is working. So that that is like one another thing to look at uh, actually. So otherwise, it's all the same. So you get kubectl, get uh, uh, deployments, and you see one deployment which is quick start kb, uh, which is a Kibana instance. If you see kubectl, get uh, or what else we can do? SVC services, and then uh, you could find out, uh, like you know, uh, the the Kubernetes cluster, which is normal, and then I have a public IP here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what I did is like uh, I have assigned public IPs to each of these, like the Elasticsearch, and then also the 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 Kibana, so that I could access them. But you don't need to do that. You can keep your Elasticsearch private. Your Kibana also you can you can use uh, you can control it via your VPN connect, etc. And then make sure that you do that. So I'm just uh, done uh, the IP address uh, colon 5601, and I got this uh, Elasticsearch. Okay, so Elastic, and then I so I told you that you could automatically the TLS and the uh, basic username password would be configured. Uh, so that is already there. So it is stored in the secrets as a password, uh, and uh, this is a standard password. I I mean, in the sense like this is a standard. Uh, uh, what do you call uh, the the elastic and username and the password? But then uh, please don't uh, use this user for everything. Create your own users. I'll also show you how you can do that. Why I lost this password thing because I have uh, I have kind of like uh, restarted the cloud shell and that's why it happened. So see, I'm just getting it from my secret store and uh, the name of the user is like quick start es elastic user and then uh, and then like it got some specific code into the password and then if i do a echo now i'll get the password and uh, i'll use that to create and i log log into the kibana system okay say something wrong maybe i think i did not copy correctly sometimes I use item, so most possibly, like you know, I just select and then think it works. It copies, but then with Cloud Shell, it's a bit different. Okay, now we are in. So, any questions meanwhile? Yeah, if you have any questions, I think uh, it's the best time to ask. Uh, we are kind of end of the session. 
uh, yeah, see it's saying like there are specific uh, things that I still need to configure. I just deployed a basic stuff. So you see the page and then um, you could go to the you could go to the left menu and all the apps that I spoke about. It's all there here. Uh, all of them are like you know free that you could use it however you want. And then uh, you could either uh, go through this particular menu and link click on that or I could do command slash or control slash and then I'll go to this particular place and then I I'll go and can create like go and create an user here um, and then like click on the create user and then it takes me to create user and then like I could create a separate user for that. Also assign uh, roles for it as well. Uh, or if you are like me and like want to try new stuff, you could also use the API keys and uh, like you know authenticate users, ex make your API keys expire, etc. Et so this is relatively new. So yeah, I think it's a long session and I've been talking for a long time. I think I, I'm happy to like you know give more information. I'll also share a, a colleague of mine has recently done a bunch of ECK based. Uh, 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 like you know, repos or configurations. Like, say, if you want to deploy a hot warm cold architecture uh, with ECK and SAML authentication, like if you want to uh, run a uh, uh, response snapshot and restore an Elasticsearch, or you run a uh, run a ECK agent, etc. So I'm gonna paste that link, that GitHub page, this GitHub page, and you could go and kind of like uh, you know, give, get that idea and like also contribute as well. So so yeah, so that's one good way to look at. I have given access uh, for people to unmute and ask questions now. Maybe if you have questions, you can also unmute and ask questions. Uh, I see a couple of questions which is coming in. Uh, can we try free demo for Elastic on Azure? Yes, you can. Um, there, I, I'll just share you the free trial link. Free trial. And we can do that. I'll share you that. Um, rest of the questions, which is coming in. In which case we need to choose Elastic Cloud versus installing Elasticsearch inside a VM. Um, I think we did discuss about it last time. Um, is that? I mean, uh, I mean, Arvind, you can take that question if you want. Yeah. So I want to specifically tell you that. Uh, no, before for answering this question, please refer to the last uh, session. If not, if you don't have a lot of time, uh, you don't want to go through 40 minutes presentation. You can go into the cloud scaling challenge first introduction to Elastic, and you will cl get clarity on what we were telling. Like Vivek was showing some a specific uh, uh, slide where when to choose what and how to choose what. Like yes, Vivek, I just you were you were showing uh, in the. Yeah, I'll share that. I'll share that now. Uh, please share that. So. That contains uh, the challenge contains uh, that information, and uh, you could you could learn that. But if I if I have to tell you right now, uh, so if you don't want to manage all of this, like you know, uh, and if you want to just uh, specifically complete your workflow, do your business, uh, like still you have to do a lot of these things. When you even if you choose a managed service, you you will just need to build your data model. You just need to start writing queries, uh, use how learn how to use APIs, etc. Everything is still open uh, but then at the same point of time um, i think uh, yeah this is the one that you show, uh, vivek was showing at the same point of time uh, you you would uh, you would also need to like uh, uh, if you are managing the elastic set by yourself you need to manage this entire infrastructure by yourself so that is something yeah this this is. table actually talks about it very clearly <coughs> on how you know which one to choose um, so net net uh, to be you know to understand if you want to manage it within the um, Azure tenant and you want to have a you know complete access to it and you want to manage it within your tenant and so that you don't want to be access outside of your Azure then you know this these are the suited options you have uh, otherwise the other options are all already available out there so you know um, I would really recommend the community to go back and uh, you know, you know, take up this cloud field challenge to understand deeply understand uh, all the three different options which we discussed in last two sessions, and also understand how Elastic Stack is 
uh, you know structured around all these things uh, from our sessions uh, you can access these videos as well uh, so that you can uh, build on top of that so any yeah. more questions which is there so i have just a few more slides to show some information and then i am i'm done actually so just the moment if i can share the screen yes okay so okay so as you could see uh, i have presented everything but then um, running stateful apps in kubernetes is not a sign sometimes it's a ad so like someone asked a question about uh, whether i should choose that or this it's up to your skill level if, and i would always recommend you to offload all the work and put your best time in the area where you do your best like i don't know how to run e-commerce uh, applications and then you you as an engineer who is working in say walmart labs you know what's what better to do right and then uh, and then like you do your best thing and i know how to run elastic search and i'll do my stuff so that's why uh, i would always recommend you to choose your your stuff basic on, based on the table that you want and then that's why also stateful sets is very important concept please do learn more about it there are more details and uh, there is a there is one more meetup that is happening uh, in in a week or so i'll try to share that up as well and it's on uh, kubernetes and uh, a devops architect from sap is trying to help uh, answer the same sort of question uh, he has implemented uh, what is the benefits of running elastic search on kubernetes uh, versus running it on a vm etc so please join us for the session as well it's a meetup that's happening uh, you could to get all the updates please join uh, the community.elastic.co uh, uh, that's the thing and other than that questions my dms are open uh, on twitter so yeah as well as linkedin please. Any any questions you have, you can unmute yourself and ask question as well. I've given that option to everyone now. Okay. Okay then, uh, Rashmita, are you there? Yes. Or? Yes. Thank you so much, Arvind and Vivek, for the session, and thank you all for joining us today. Please feel free to do event check-in and share your feedback about today's session. It will help us to choose our topics better. Also, please visit our Microsoft Reactor Bengaluru Meetup page for more upcoming sessions. Thank you all once again, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone.